Okay. Well, hello, everyone. My name is Jamie Clark. And on behalf of the web checkout team, thank you for joining our annual user symposium. This is a big week for us. So along with this event, we released version July 2021. You can find our release notes online at our documentation site, um, as well as a recording of our last study hall, which we highlighted improvements and new features of this July release. Um, but today we have four presentations to showcase. We'll begin today's session with Brittany Wood, who will show us how to clean up your resources and resource types with advanced imports, um, followed by yours truly, that's me, where I will review report automations uh, using our data feeds and Google Data Studio. And then we'll take a short break. And this afternoon, AJ Utman will highlight the new Facilities app. Uh, this is to manage physical keys. And then John Solorzano, our Information Security Analyst and Level 3 Tech Support, he wears many hats, uh, he will shine an important light on our hosting service and how we keep your data safe. And that's not all. Join us tomorrow, same time, same place for customer presentations. Uh, Jake Casson will kick off day two with showcasing his custom reservation portal, which he, which he and his team created using the web checkout API, followed by Cecile Cezanne, who will share her inventory organization and student staff training best practices. And wrapping up our event will be Colleen Bittinger, who uses web checkout to manage static non-equipment non-circulating equipment. So very different topics from our customers tomorrow. So sit back and relax and I'll turn it over to Brittany Wood and Advance Import Data Cleanup. Brittany? Thanks, Jeannie. So welcome everyone and thank you for joining our user symposium today. My name is Brittany Wood and I'll be your host for our session this morning. All right. Um, so today's session is going to focus on advanced import scenarios, and this is going to require some um, basic knowledge of our new import files. We will not have enough time today during our session to cover both the basics of using import files and advanced scenarios. If you would like a review of our new advanced import files, please visit our YouTube channel or documentation site to view a recording of Study Hall A which was dedicated to this new feature. Now we do expect that there will be questions. So if you have any, please use the Zoom chat feature, which you will find by moving your mouse towards the bottom of the Zoom screen. Please be sure to send your chat to everyone and our customer care team will respond. Now, as a reminder, this session is recorded and for audio quality, everyone is muted. And we'll follow up with a link to our recording as well as the sample files we are going to review today. So let's begin. All right, so during today's session, we will focus on updating the resource and the resource type data that you see on the screen in front of you right now. So as you can see, this data is very disorganized, which can lead to issues with the user experience in both web checkout and patron portal. Disorganized data can also make it very difficult to manage your assets long term. We'll use our time today to update these resources and resource types into a more unified and user-friendly set of data. For best practice, we recommend periodically making changes as needed to keep your data updated and organized. To transform this data, we'll break these changes in we'll break these changes up into several steps or several import scenarios. We'll start by first updating the origin of our resources and resource types. Next, we'll update our resource type unique identifiers. After our resource type unique identifiers are updated, we'll focus on updating our resource type names as well as the organization of our parent and subtype structure. Once updates to resource types are complete, we'll focus on updating our resources. First, we'll update our resource label IDs and then we'll ensure that all resources are assigned the correct resource type or decommissioned properly. So let's get started. So we're going to begin by updating the origin of our resource and resource type data. So we'll navigate to our find resources screen and web checkout first to review our data. 
Now, origin indicates how the record was originally created. External origin indicates that the data was created via import, while local origin indicates that the record was originally created within the application. Those of you who have been using Web Checkout for some time now may know all too well the headache of dealing with import errors when data includes a mix of local and external origins. Now, with advanced imports, you can update origin in mass. This will make all of our remaining import changes run more smoothly. Updates to the resource and resource type data, updating the, re updating the resource and resource type data to a single origin will make it easier for us to make the other changes to our data and minimize the number of multiple import errors. We'll start by reviewing the current or origin of data to review next steps. You can see that our data is currently using two origins, local and external. To set all resources to a single origin, we'll update the resources with a local origin to external. We'll start by adjusting our find screens to create our import file. So currently, we've included the search term for resource type ancestor to limit results. And we've also already included a result column that includes origin. This is what is allowing us to compare our origin right now. To create our import file, we'll include one more search term and we'll add the search term of origin. And this is going to further limit results to only those resources of a local origin. Now we'll update the resources that you see on the screen right now with a local origin to external so that all resources have one consistent origin. Now we'll export our file to make our changes. To export the file, we'll select export as and export importable. Now let's update our import file to change our resource origin. To save time, I've already uploaded the exported file to Google. Now our goal with this import is to have all of our resources set to one origin to make the rest of our updates easier. We'll start by adjusting the configuration section found at the top of the file. The configuration section determines settings for the import. First, we'll adjust our origin setting. To update the origin via import, the current origin of the data must match the origin found in our origin configuration section. Since the resources are currently local, we'll adjust the configuration to also appear as local. Now, I like to copy and paste the origin to ensure that it matches exactly. So I'm going to copy local and I'm going to paste it into the origin field and we'll hold on to the external origin for right now. Now, what we're going to do is update um, the resource origin found on the file. So the actual origin column in the data section. And we'll update the origin column so that this appears as external. So I like to copy that external origin and paste it into the data section, and then I can delete it. So now our configuration is set to local and our data section is set to external. Now, as a final step, I'm going to move the columns that I'm not updating to the non-import column section. This will minimize room for import errors and unintentional changes. So I'll move checkout center, resource type, and meta class to non-import columns and remove them as an import column. Now you could also delete these columns and the headers entirely from the file. Now we'll import this file. So we need to be sure that we save or download our file as a CSV with UTF-8 encoding. And then we'll navigate to the import data app. We'll start first by backing up our database. So in our newest version, you can, this can now be done in the import data app by selecting this backup icon. Now let's import our data. So we'll add our file first, and then we'll select validate and promote. 
Now, please be sure to pay attention to the feedback, particularly the total rows found at the top, um, which show the number of new records being created and the existing records being updated. Also, it's important to check for import errors during each step of the import. Now, if you do run into an import error, we recommend updating the data to resolve the errors prior to moving on to the next import step. So now that we've imported our data, let's review. So we're going to navigate back to the Find Resource screen, adjust our search terms, and we can now see that we've refreshed our results that all resources now have an external origin. This will allow us to import resources to a single origin and might make our remaining changes. Now let's review our origin for resource types. So we'll navigate to our find resource type screen in web checkout. And we have used similar search terms and result columns that we used on the resource screen to review origin. So we've already included the ancestor search term to limit our results to only those included within our user symposium set of data. And we've also already included a result column for origin as well. Now we can see that our resource types also have a mix of local and external origin. However, since there's really only one resource type with a local origin, I'm going to change that manually. Now this could also be done via import, but it's quicker to make minor or one-off changes manually in web checkout. To update the origin, we're going to select the resource type name and then update the origin in the admin tab. So here we can adjust origin and set this to external and save. Now to navigate back to the find resource types page, I'm going to use the breadcrumbs found at the bottom of the screen. Now reviewing the find resource type screen, you can see that all types have a consistent origin of external. Now that our records have the same external origin, let's update the resources and resource types to provide a more organized layout and consistent naming convention. Now reviewing our resource and resource types in the timeline scheduler, it's easy to see that we'll want to make some changes. So the resource types and the resources do not use the same naming convention or even consistent capitalization, making these names appear messy and difficult to understand. Additionally, we can see that some of the resource types are not nested in a way that makes sense to the user. You may also notice that there are some cameras that are not nested into a subtype, rather they're assigned to the user symposium data. And then there's this rogue Canon 5i type that's nested underneath the Canon T3i type. Now this becomes even more confusing to a student in the patron portal who isn't used to our data. So we're looking at our user symposium data and patron portal, and you can see it looks like we just have two different types of cameras. But as we navigate to that Canon T3i, there's that T5i, which makes it difficult for the student to understand what to do at this point. Now, additionally, going back into the timeline scheduler, if we hover our mouse over some of these resources, we can see that some have a condition note or a description of lost or broken. So these resources should really be decommissioned. Now to make our data more user-friendly and easy to understand, we'll start by updating our resource types and then we'll actually update the individual resources. Let's get started with our resource type data. So we'll navigate back to our find resource type screen. And again, we're going to use the ancestor search term to limit our results to a portion of our data. Now we'll also include several result columns um, to allow us to review our resource type data on our find screen. So we'll remove origin. And at this point, I'm going to add organization, parent, and our resource type ID and select find so we can view our results. 
Now, looking at these results, we can begin to see quite a few issues here. So our resource type names, looking at all of them together, you can see that they're very inconsistent. And the parent resource types show, it that, show us that subtypes are not nested well. And also we can start to see that our resource type IDs are non-identifiable numeric identifiers. Now this is technically okay. However, I find it difficult to work with these resource type identifiers, especially since I like to update my data via import. To update our resource types, we'll begin by first updating this resource type ID and then we'll make changes to our resource type names and to the nesting of our parent resource types. Now resource type ID is the unique identifier used as the primary key for each resource type. Resource type ID is typically the lookup column on the resource type import. To make changes to the resource type ID, we must use a different unique identifier as the lookup column on the import file. For resource types, there is no default secondary unique identifier. However, using custom properties, we can add our own. Now, I've already created a secondary unique identifier for resource types using custom properties. Now, you can add a custom property to resource types to add your own unique identifier, just like I did. By selecting new custom property, selecting resource type, and setting the type to unique ID. Now you can see that our custom property here called custom resource type ID. Um, we can use this custom unique ID as a lookup column, but we'll need to add the proper header onto our import files. You can find the import file, the import header by reviewing the import name column on our custom property um, tab here. You can also find the column, the column header on the import data app. So navigating to the information section of the import data app, we can see our custom resource type header is now found under unique ID properties. And finally, you can add the custom property as a result column on the find screen to export the correct column header. Now, this is actually my favorite and the easiest way to add a custom property header to an import file. So in result columns, I'm going to add our custom resource type ID. And now we've added it as a column that we can export. So now that we've added our custom unique ID to our results, let's export our file. So we'll select export as and export importable. Now let's take a look at our file. To update our resource type unique identifier, we'll perform a few steps. So first, we're going to update and import a brand new custom unique ID. Then we'll update the file to make this brand new custom unique ID, the lookup column. This allows us to add the resource type ID as an import column and actually update the resource type ID. Now, finally, we can remove the custom unique ID so it's no longer included. This step is optional. Let's get started. First, we'll add an identifier to the custom unique ID column. To make this change easy, I'm just going to copy and paste the current resource type ID into the custom unique ID column. So I'm literally just copying and pasting. For now, the lookup column will remain set to resource type ID. So no changes are needed here yet. As we're only looking to update the new custom unique ID, for the import columns, I will remove all other headers besides the custom unique ID into the non-import column field. So we'll leave custom resource type ID as an import column and move our other three column headers to the non-import column section. Now this way, all fields um, will not be updated. So we're only just updating the custom resource type ID field. All right, now let's go ahead and import our file. 
So we'll export our file as a CSV. And now we'll navigate to the import data app and back up our database. And now we'll import our file. And select validate and promote looking through errors. Now, as a reminder, you must add your file, validate, and promote to complete this import process. And if errors appear in any step, please review your files to resolve any errors. So now that our data has been imported, we can navigate back to that find page in Web Checkout, refresh our data, um, and we can see our brand new custom resource type ID has appeared. Now we'll return back to our file to change that resource type ID. Now we could choose to re-export our data, but I'm going to continue to use the same file to make those necessary changes here. First, we'll adjust our configuration section. We'll update the lookup column so that it's set to custom unique ID. This will allow us to change the resource type ID via import. Additionally, we'll move the custom um, resource, the Additionally, we'll move the resource type ID column into the import column section. All right, so let's move these around. There we go. Now we'll also wanna move the name and the parent to the import column so that we can update those as well. So we'll move name as well as parent to the import column section and delete those from the non-import column. All right, now first I'm going to start by adjusting the name of our resource types. Name is the friendly label for resource types that appear in both Web Checkout and Patron Portal. And for best practice, this should be easily identifiable and consistent. Now, I like the way that my Canon uh, T3i is currently named, so I'm going to model my other resource type names after this type so that they all appear consistent. And as you're updating names, you do just wanna make sure all of your spacing is consistent as well. So you'll see me checking the spacing um, in between all of the words. All right, now I'm going to update our resource type ID column. And for best practice, we recommend using a consistent naming convention. Now I like to duplicate the resource type name and include a short acronym referencing the organization or the parent resource type to ensure uniqueness. So for our resource type ID, I'm literally just going to grab the resource type name and include a space um, hyphen space WCO. And I'm going to copy the unique identifiers and paste our values only. All right, now that our resource type IDs and our names are easier to understand, let's update our parent column. To update the parent column, we'll copy and paste the resource type ID of the resource type that comes before or the parent um, into this column. So let's adjust our parent column. So I want all three of my Canon cameras to fall under the user symposium type. And then I'm going to remove the parent from this random subtype we have because I don't want it cluttering up our view in the timeline. So now that I've made my changes, we'll go ahead and save our file as a CSV and import. All right, I'm going to back up the database. And we'll add our file. Select validate and promote, checking for errors along the way. 
And now if we navigate back into web checkout and refresh our results, um, we can see that our changes have taken place. Additionally, if we review this data on the timeline scheduler, we can start to see that our resource types are starting to look a little bit cleaner um, and it's a little bit easier to navigate um, through the resource type structure. Now let's go ahead and remove that custom unique ID. This is an optional step, but it helps to keep our data clean and removes extraneous unique identifiers that are not being used. And we'll use that same import file. Now first, we'll adjust the configuration section again. And we are going to move the resource type ID back up into the lookup column row, since that value is the primary key and not being changed. And we'll move the custom unique ID to the import column row as we're looking to clear out this value. So resource type ID is becoming our lookup column and the custom resource type ID is becoming an import column. And all other columns will be moved to the non-import column row since our, our goal is only to remove the custom unique ID value. So we'll move name and parent to non-import columns. Now let's update our data section. So to update our data section, we'll simply delete all information found under the custom resource type ID column header. Now let's save our file and import. And once again, we'll back up our database, choose our file and select validate and promote. And now if we navigate back to our find resource type screen in web checkout and refresh our data, we can see that our custom resource type ID um, has been removed from all of these resource type records. Now that we've updated our resource types, let's update our resources. So we'll start again by reviewing our data. So we'll navigate back to the timeline scheduler. Now, as you can see, our types have been updated. So we'll focus on these individual resources. To finish cleaning up our data, we'll need to update the resource type IDs um, and ensure that the resources are assigned to the correct resource types. So we'll start by exporting our data. So we're going to navigate to the find resources screen. And to limit results, we've already included the resource type ancestor search term. Now let's add a few result columns so that we can properly update our resources. So we'll remove origin and we will add our resource type result column. Checkout center. Barcode condition note, and description. And select Find to view our results. Now we'll export this data and begin making changes. So we're going to select Export As and Export Importable. Now let's take a look at our exported file in Google Sheets. So just like in our previous file, we'll update our data in two steps. We'll begin first by updating our resource label ID so that it is consistent and easier to understand. Then we'll move our resources into the correct resource type and decommission our resources if necessary. To begin updating our resource label ID, we'll adjust our configuration section. To update the label ID, we'll first need to make this an import column and use a different unique identifier as the lookup column, similar to what we just accomplished with the resource type ID. So let's refer to the import data app to view unique identifiers. So I'm navigating back to the information section in the import data app, and we're looking at our resource information. 
Now we can see that under unique ID properties that we can also use barcode in addition to label ID. All right, so I'll update our lookup column to barcode and move label ID into the import column section. So we're moving barcode to the lookup column and label ID into the import column section. Now, finally, I'll move all other rows I'm not updating into the non-import column section. So check out center resource type, all of these other columns that we're referring to will go to the non-import column section. Now let's update our label IDs in the data section. To make it easier to update my label IDs, I'm going to sort my data by the resource type column so that like items appear together. So now that like items are listed together, I wanna to point out that there are some resources found at the bottom of our import file that are incorrectly assigned to the wrong resource type. So you can see these four resources are assigned to that user symposium data, that top level resource type. Since these may require a bit more investigation to ensure that they are labeled correctly, we'll come back to these resources last. For all other resources, we can update our label ID. Now for label ID, we do recommend um, using a consistent naming convention, just like with the resource type names. Now I like to create label IDs by combining three identifiers for consistency and uniqueness. So I always like to use the resource type name, plus include a short acronym representing the checkout center, and then I also like to include a numeric identifier at the end, such as 001 or a portion of the barcode or serial number. So in my data, I'm going to use the resource type name, append WCO, just like we did in our types, and I'm going to add a simple three-digit numeric identifier. And I always just like to make sure my data is lining up to the correct types and just be mindful of those spacing when you're adding label IDs so that everything's consistent and neat. All right, now that we've updated our label IDs for most of our resources, let's focus on these highlighted resources found at the bottom of our data. These resources are incorrectly assigned to the wrong resource type, which means that we'll need to investigate further by reviewing the resource information or by actually locating these exact resources. And our use in our case, we're going to refer to the old label ID to determine the new ID. So as you can see, looking at these current label IDs, they do reference the type of resource that the asset really is. But for best practice, if you're in a similar situation where resources are assigned to the wrong type and your label IDs aren't very identifiable, I recommend locating the exact resources to make sure these are labeled correctly and placed into the correct type. All right, so we'll adjust these label IDs. And we're being mindful that we're not duplicating the same numeric identifiers at the end because label ID should be unique. So now that all of our label IDs are updated, let's import. So we're going to download our file as a CSV. And then we're going to navigate to the import data app and back up the database. And then we'll choose our file and select validate and promote. 
Now let's review our changes. So we'll navigate back to the find resource page and web checkout and refresh our results. And we can start to see that our label IDs have been updated. And now if we navigate to the timeline scheduler and look at our data, you can start to see that things are starting to look a lot cleaner. However, the timeline scheduler does still remain looking just a bit messy because we haven't yet moved our resources to the correct type um, or decommissioned. So we're going to navigate back to our import file and move the resources to the correct resource type and decommission any assets that are in disrepair. So just like within our previous steps, we'll update our configuration section first. So we're going to update our, or we're going to leave our lookup column set to barcode. And we'll also update our import columns and our non-import columns. So label ID, this is going to be moved to the non-import column section and resource type and checkout center will be moved to the import column section. So label ID will be included as a non-import column. And then checkout center and resource type will be our import columns. All right, now let's take a look at our data section. So most of our resources are currently assigned to the correct type, except for these resources at the bottom of our data that are incorrectly assigned to the parent resource type of user symposium data. So we'll adjust the resource type of these to assign to the correct resource type. So this resource should be a Canon T7i, and then our other three resources should be assigned to the T5i. And I'm just literally copy and copying and pasting the resource type IDs from the other similar assets. So next we'll review the condition notes and descriptions to see if any resources should be decommissioned and move to our decommission checkout center. So as we can see from some of these condition notes and descriptions that are now highlighted in red, these are listed as lost or broken. And for best practice, these resources should really be decommissioned. For accurate decommissioning, we recommend moving a resource to a decommissioned checkout center and a decommissioned resource type. For those resources, we'll grab the correct checkout center name and resource type ID directly from web checkout. So we're going to navigate into web checkout and I'm going to navigate to my decommissioned equipment checkout center. And I'm going to admin checkout center into the general tab to just grab the checkout center name. And to ensure that the checkout center name matches exactly, I am just going to copy and paste the checkout center name directly from this field in web checkout right into our file. So now we'll assign resources to the decommissioned type at the new decommissioned organization. So just like with that checkout center name, I'm going to copy and paste the resource type identifier directly from web checkout into the file. So I'm gonna go back to web checkout, but this time I'm going to search for a resource type. And here's our decommissioned type that we want to use. And I'm going to navigate to the admin tab and grab the resource type ID, not the name. And I'm going to copy the resource type identifier and paste that into the resource type column for our three resources that need to be decommissioned. So now that the data is updated to move the resources to the correct resource type and checkout center, Let's import. So once again, we're going to download this file as a CSV. And we're going to navigate to our import data app. Back up our database. And we'll choose our file. 
select validate and promote. And as a reminder, we always recommend backing up the database prior to importing. So now that our import is complete, let's do a final review. So we'll go back into our web co-production center. And I'm going to navigate to the timeline scheduler for our final review. And we can now see that the resources as well as the resource types are named consistently and look much cleaner and it is a lot easier to navigate through. So we can see all three of our camera types are presented and all of our resource type IDs are really consistent and look really clean on the screen. And in patron portal, the resource types are going to be much easier for the students to navigate through as well. So you can see as we log in, If I navigate to that user symposium data, we see all three of our camera types presented in front of us, and I can easily review individual items and understand what they are much clearly. All right, now before we end our session today, I want to leave you with some quick tips for imports. Now, um, for imports, we always recommend reviewing the origin before making changes via imports. Um, for best practice, we recommend using a single consistent origin for resource and resource type data. Remember, you always import to an origin, so it's best to review prior to importing any files. We do not typically recommend using Excel to edit your data. We typically recommend um, text edit, LibreOffice, or Google Sheets to edit and create import files. If you do use Excel, we recommend opening um, the CSV and text edit to ensure that the file is saved in the proper file format. So your CSV should be in the UTF-8 file format. We recommend um, deleting or moving columns you are not updating to the non-import column section. Any columns left as an import column leaves potential for import errors. By eliminating these columns, you are minimizing the number of extraneous errors that may appear when you're importing data. Also, I recommend just deleting any extra rows or columns that appear on your file. This is typically my first step to troubleshoot any files since there could be data that we are missing in any of those cells that could be causing an error. Make sure your lookup columns and import columns match the columns included in the data section. A lot of times we'll see extra columns deleted from the data section, but we'll still remain in that configuration section of the file. So make sure if you do delete or include a column in the data section that this is also re reflected in that configuration section. Use fine screens and export as importable in web checkout to create your import files. This will ensure that your import headers are listed correctly and that data in web checkout is included on the file. Break large changes up into several steps. This is exactly what I did today. So breaking large changes up into multiple smaller steps will help to make these major changes much more obtainable. And this will also help to make any errors easier to pinpoint. Check your data after import. So we always recommend checking your data right after you import to ensure that the changes that were made were what you originally envisioned. And when in doubt, refer to our documentation. So our docs are a guide to help prevent import errors essentially. So we do recommend referring to those whenever you're updating your import files. Um, now advanced imports will be the only import method in our fall release. So this also means for those with patron and group integration, the files must be updated in the new advanced import format. So please do familiarize yourself with advanced imports and please review that March study hall webinar where we provide a comprehensive review of advanced imports, including changes to patron and group files for integration. So thank you all so much for your time. Are there any questions about imports or cleaning up resource and resource type data.
Thanks, Brittany. You made it look really easy. Uh, so we should call this simple or easy imports instead of advanced imports. But I, that was a great review. As Brittany mentioned, we're opening it up for questions. And I did chat in the uh, in Zoom a link to our YouTube where Brittany reviewed advanced imports and uh, highlighted the changes to patron and groups, as she mentioned, for imports as well as for integration. Um, this advanced import and the advanced import files will be the only format available starting um, in our fall or the last release of this year. So you have a couple months to get your data files in the correct format uh, before we retire the old files. Any questions? It looks like there's one question in the chat uh, to define lookup columns, import columns, and non-import columns more clearly. Um, so let me go ahead and navigate to one of our import files. So the lookup column defines the unique identifier for that import. So the lookup column cannot change. Um, essentially, you're going to leave the lookup column untouched. So for our resource import, this could be the label ID or the barcode. So this is a unique value that remains unchanged and it is, is essentially the key that allows your import columns to update while your lookup column remains consistent. Now the import column row, this defines the columns that can be updated when you import. So for example, if we were to include um, resource type as an import column, we're telling web checkout any changes in the data section to either origin or resource type, these will be right pushed into the data and those fields will be updated. Whereas non-import columns, these are defining the fields that are not going to be updated by import. So even if I was to update my resource type data and adjust my resource types in the data section, because the resource type is in non-import columns, Web Checkout's not actually going to change the data or import that data because resource type is a non-import column. So I hope that that makes everything a little bit clearer about the difference between lookup, importer, non-import columns. Yeah, are there any other questions about the advanced import files or resource and resource type data? I do want to read, Katie posted this in chat and you may all be aware of this, but this with advanced imports, it's called advanced not because it's difficult, but because there's so much you can do with it. Um, it is a powerful tool. And one of the new features is that you can change, you can make changes to checked out and reserved items. You previously could not do that with the, the regular imports or the old imports, I should say. And another new feature with advanced imports, you can import to your custom properties. Again, all of these features were highlighted in the webinar that I posted. Um, and this information is on in our documentation. Any more questions before we wrap up the advanced import section? Robert asks, if they have seven to 9,000 items, is it easier to break up the file import? Definitely easier. <laughs> Robert, as you saw, Brittany used the resource type ancestor search term. You may want to uh, break it down by resource types. I mean, you certainly can import seven to 9,000 resources, but just the organizing and managing that data could get a little difficult. So breaking it down by types might be easier. To manage. Uh, good question. Robin asks, can you update the status non-circulating versus available of a piece of equipment in mass like the origin? 
I believe you should be able to update from non-circulating to circulating as long as the non-circulating item is not assigned to a department or a person. Right. Or um, as, lo as long as the item is also not checked out. So you can't mm -hmm. check out a resource or return it via import. But you can make non-circulating items circulating and circulating items, non-circulating. You're welcome, Robin. Okay, if no further questions, thank you again, Brittany, for your wonderful advanced import review and helping us clean up our data. Now's a great time to do it. Well, hopefully things are a little bit slower before the new term begins. Excellent. Thanks, Jeannie. Okay, I am going to now share my screen. Can you all see my screen now? All right, great. Okay, well, let me just double check here. All right, great, thanks for confirming you can see my screen. Uh, right. Okay, so hello everyone. Again, my name is Jeannie Clark and welcome to our session on reporting automation through web checkout data feeds and Google Data Studio. So I'm gonna start with asking you all a question um, and just, Give this some thought, think about it. How often are you pulling data out of web checkout? So for example, how often do you check to see when your inventory needs to be replaced or review resources with a poor condition grade? Or how frequently are you running the resource schedule report to find all checked out resources and their usage time and who used those items, gathering all that important usage information? If you've answered all too often that you wished for or even emailed us and requested that there was an automated solution to generate these reports, look no further. Um, I am here today to highlight data feeds to automate the pulling of web checkout data and utilizing Google Data Studio to tell a story and make data-driven business decisions based on your web checkout data. So let's start with the basics. Uh, what are data feeds? Great question. Uh, data feeds are a way for web checkout to provide data to other applications and services without requiring a login. The data are up to the minute, so it's real-time data when requested and are formatted with other applications in mind so those applications can pull in and read the data from web checkout. The ICS calendars, which are currently in web checkout, they're a perfect example of this. Uh, with the ICS calendar feeds, a URL is provided either at the checkout center, resource type, resources, and individual users to view allocation activity as a calendar entry. Data feeds take the same concept of calendar feeds and provide real-time results from any fine screen report in either a CSV or JSON format. So here you see in my slide here, an example of a data feed URL, which is in a CSV format. Data feed, uh, our development team creates this URL based on the specified report in web checkout. Data feed URLs are not readily available within the, applica within the application. It is a custom, uh, custom work. So what can data feeds be used for? Again, any application that can read uh, data can use data feeds. And some examples are digital signage, such as signs on rooms showing their availability or checkout centers. Uh, in front of your checkout center, you can show your operating hours. Uh, Real-time status reports for highly used resources, resources with less than a fair condition grade, for example, or upcoming replacement dates. You can also provide uh, displays to different web pages, such as your instant institution's website and display web checkout information. 
And finally, what we'll be focusing today is creating custom dashboards and reports that automatically update with the latest web checkout data. Now, we understand that getting meaningful information out of web checkout is imperative to running your operations. And while we can provide the data, we leave it up to the data visualization experts such as Google, Power BI, Tableau to, make, to take this information and place it into a visual context such as tables and graphs. Today, I'll be using Google Data Studio to make sense of my web checkout data. So what is Google Data Studio? Uh, it's a free online tool to turn data into visually informative reports and dashboards to measure your key performance indicators, visualize trends, and compare activity over time. So reports in Google Data Studio are interactive. They're easy to set up. They're easy to customize and to share with others. And best of all, once the reports are created, you won't have to spend time recreating or even updating the reports with fresh data. By connecting Web Checkout's data feed into Google Data Studio, Web Checkout data is provided in real time, and these reports will refresh and update automatically with the latest Web Checkout activity. Now, I'm using Google Data Studio because the tool is powerful, it's easy to use, and not to mention it's free. Uh, but again, any data visualization tool that can connect to other data sources can utilize our data feed. Uh, I will be demonstrating how to import your data into Google Sheets, and then from Google Sheets, we'll connect to Google Data Studio. I've also created a suite of reports, which uh, we'll be sharing with you on Monday with these recordings. But for a full tutorial on how to use Google Data Studio, please review the library of YouTube videos created by Google Data Studio experts. All right, so let's begin. All right, I'm gonna start by going into web checkout and let's begin with the data feed. So as I mentioned, data feeds provide real-time results from any find screen report and the feed URL is generated by our web checkout team. It's not readily available within the application. However, from the find screen, you will create and provide us with the custom report and we'll generate the feed and provide you with the URL. So I'm interested in usage activity. So I'm in the resources menu, find resource schedules report. This is the recommended report if you're interested in reporting on usage activity because it includes usage activity for each allocated resource. From the find uh, resource schedule report, you can adjust search terms. And you can now add search terms, as you saw Brittany show us, by keyword searches. This is new in the July release. Okay. And search terms, again, they specify what activity or what information you're, you're interested in. Then you'll add result columns or the data fields to include in your report. We've included additional uh, result columns in the July release. Patron class has been added. I know that was a, a highly requested field to include in the resource schedule report. And then once you've created your custom report or the fields that you are looking for, you'll click options and create new search and give a name for your search. And then click save. Right. I've already created a custom report, usage data for reporting. And I've included several uh, fields that are result columns that I'm interested in, in patron de department, resource type, um, scheduled resource value. And I'm only interested in checkout completed uh, resources at my checkout center. Again, you can include all of the schedule types and several checkout centers if you're looking to aggregate this information from multiple uh, checkout centers. Okay. Now, from this report, again, our, our team will provide the, the feed URL. And let's now go into Google where I will show you what the data feed looks like. All right, so here is Google Sheets. Now, this may look like an export from web checkout. And essentially that is what it is, but the data was pulled into this sheet by this feed URL here, okay? In the first cell, I've simply used a import data formula and copy paste the URL wrapped in quotations. 
And with this, the data will load into the sheet and will update as frequently as Google Sheets pulls in the data. We are at the mercy of the refresh schedule of the application reading the data. So for proof of concept, and just to show you how easy it is to pull this in, let's take this URL and I'm going to demonstrate how you can import this data into web, into your, uh, into Google Sheets. So I'll just use this second worksheet here and enter in my formula, import data, open parens, quotation, copy, paste my URL, close parens, and hit return. And there is the data that I'm interested in. All right, and that's it. You can format the data fields that you need to. Mine have been form, form excuse me, formatted. And to show you that this data is being updated automatically, I'm gonna to jump to the bottom of my report here at the end of my report. And you can see here that I have activity for items that were returned today as recently as 10 a.m. And I promise you, I was not playing around with data and adding it to my report at 10 a.m. this morning. I was preparing for this, this session. So you set up the data feed and web checkout will automatically pull in the data into your source, All right? So now that my feed is set up, my data source is set up, okay? Let's move on to connecting Google Sheets to Google Data Studio to make sense of this data. To do this, you will need to log into Google Data Studio. Again, it's a free, uh, free account that you sign in with your Google account, okay? And then we'll start with a blank report. We'll click the plus sign. And now it's going to ask you to connect to your data source. Since we are using Google Sheets, we'll select Google Sheets here. It'll then give you a list of all of your Google Sheet reports. I'm using this usage data feed. And it'll give you an option of your worksheets. We're gonna select worksheet one. Yes, I wanna use the first row as header and then we'll click add. By clicking add, automatically your data will load into your Google Data Studio report. And you can see here on the right-hand side, this is what you'll use to create and edit the charts that are being highlighted. So right now it's showing my allocation name. So my individual allocations and the record count, it's actually showing me the number of resources within each checkout. Okay, I can click on the dimension or the field and edit. So I can call this uh, checkout. And record count, I can change this and call this resource count. Okay. Now let's add a chart together. From my menu option, add a chart, let's add a time series to view the total checkouts month over month. So I'll select chart and I'll select the place to create my chart. And automatically, it's pulling in information based on my real start time, which is what I want to, uh, which is what I want to look at. I want to look at the start time of my allocations, but it's showing me the exact dates, right? I actually want to see this information month over month, so I can simply click on that icon to edit my my field here, and I want to call this month. And with my type of data that it's pulling and showing, instead of date and time, I can simply select month. Right, how easy was that? So now I'm showing my total record count, which is actually my resource counts, the number of resources month over month. Okay, now let's say I also wanna see the total number of unique checkouts within this time frame. I can see here is my available fields, right? I have allocation name. I can click and drag to this add metric or simply click the plus sign, select what information I wanna to add to this chart, allocation name, all right? And what's really neat about this for all of you data junkies out there, 
my usage data, it has the allocation listed multiple times, right? Every single, it's listed as many as per resource included in your checkout. So my checkout 1522, I have a lot of items in this checkout. But in Google Data Studio, what it did, it provided a distinct or a unique allocation count. So if you've been using Excel and pivot tables, you knew you know you had to use calculations to to add that information or to calculate unique values. Now Google Data Studio is so smart, it'll do it for you. So this is my unique checkout. And my record count, we'll call this as resource count, edit that. And I wanna add labels to this so I know exactly what the values are. So I navigate over to the style, show data labels, and you have the option to change the, the colors of your graph as well. And one step further, so you're show, I'm showing activity all the way to December. The reason is my data is pulling from previous years. You can add a, a control or a filter, and I'm gonna add a date range control. And you can have it select an auto date range. And I'm just interested in this year to date activity. Okay. And so now it took out my previous year's activity. But you can take this an even step further. Uh, Google Data Studio has this awesome comparison date range option. You can compare this to previous year, previous period. So if I wanted to see what the activity for my resource count and my checkout counts for the same period last year, uh, I can do that previous period. It automatically sets those dates and apply. Give it a second to update. And I would probably change the colors so I can view the, the differences a little better here, but that's it. It did all that for me in just a few simple clicks, all right? So it's that simple. And I can see here that June was the busiest month for us this year, um, and, but it looks like last year I was even busier. Go figure, right? So this is a really powerful tool and there are a lot of reporting options, but it's really pretty intuitive. You just have to spend some time clicking around. And again, there's several YouTube videos that are really helpful um, to walk you through how to create your reports. One side note though, how frequently Google Data Studio refreshes data is not, uh, it's, it's, it's preset within this application within Google Data Studio. So although Web Checkout's data feed is in real time, it's up to the minute. If I go into my resources and manage my, uh, my data source here, you can see here the data refreshes as frequently as up to 15 minutes. Um, if you are not using this report on the daily, you may want it to refresh every 12 hours. Okay, so I've already created a suite of reports using our data feed from the find resource schedule report. I'm gonna put this into present mode here. And this is a report that I can share with you all that we will share with you all. And you can use this as a template. So with the find uh, as a template and add your data feed into this to get similar information. So just to review what I've done from just the simple find resource schedule report and Google Data Studio, this first report here, I'm showing just a high level monthly summary of my total completed checkouts and total checked out resource count, right? There's a date filter here if you wanted to narrow this down to a specific time period. I'm also including a, a review of uh, my, my resource type, the number of resources checked out each month, right? Moving on to my next report, I broke this down by patron usage. I'm interested in by patron department. I can see the unique number of patrons per department, their total completed checkouts, uh, their total resource count. My TV production team here has taken out a lot of equipment. Um, the average resource count per checkout and total usage hours. This was all calculated through Google Data Studio. Again, this is just the raw data. Um, and Google Data Studio did the calculations. 
And I'm also, I was interested to see how many unique patrons we serviced each month over month. Okay. I broke it down even further by resource type. I wanted to see the total count of checked out resources. So there's 14, or ARIs were checked out 14 times this year, but only six unique resources of that type were checked out. And here's the total usage hours. One step further, I wanted to see this by the individual resource, right? So how many, what of our resources, how many times were they checked out and the total usage hours? And you can adjust this filter it by resource type and filter it by date. This is my monthly comparison report that I started out with. Again, this is great information so you can staff or just prepare for the upcoming years based on previous years. Again, last year may be in kind of a wash, but if you have information from 2018, 2019 and you wanna compare it, um, you can definitely do so here. And then I'm interested in day of week activity. What days of the week are we the busiest? Again, for staffing purposes, uh, I can see that uh, looks like it's pretty consistently busy. This was for the month of July. If I actually wanted to just take this and move it to, let's say this year, just to get an aggregate, a better picture of our schedules or our busy days of the week. My top graph shows our activity by pickups days of the week in the resource counts. Wednesday seem to be busy, as well as my graph down here shows me returns by day of the week. So it looks like Wednesdays and Fridays are pretty busy, which uh, especially busy for returns on Fridays, which is typical because we want all of our equipment back before the weekend. And then hourly activity, again, for staffing purposes, um, my line graph shows me the total outgoing resources where the bars are showing me the total pickups at the top and then total returns down here at the bottom. For staffing purposes here, I can see you know, between 10 a.m. and 4 p.m. or maybe 3 p.m. is our busiest time. And then we have some outliers where we've got some busy, uh, some activity at the end of the day. So outside of Google Data Studio, these reports would take me several formulas. If you guys joined us, I think two years ago, I did a whole uh, session on pivot tables, snooze fest, and it's a lot of adding additional uh, formulas and creating tables and charts. Um, but with Google Data Studio, it merely takes minutes and a few clicks to create these really awesome and interactive reports. Um, and that's not all with this, application, Google Data Studio, you can add up to five data sources in one report, which means in addition to the usage data, I can add in inventory data, like information from the fine resource report, uh, and add that information to the suite of reports here. So from the fine resource screen, I created a custom report to show resource by resource schedule, uh, or excuse me, resource status and condition grade. Uh, so I can see in real time, the percentage of my resources and their current status. Uh, I can see you know, for about 50% of my resources are available, um, non-circulating about 10% and you know, just the, minuscule amount are offline or deleted. And then by condition grade is really important too. I want to see how good are, what is the state of my inventory? I may have condition grade key here. So two, one and two are excellent and good. So mo a majority of my equipment is in good condition. I have some that are fair, um, very few that are poor and nothing that's very poor. Probably very poor is out in my decommissioned checkout center. And I've also included my resource type inventory summary. Sorry, I'm not sure why this key here is still stuck on my screen. Um, but what I've done with this report is I've, by resource type, I'm including the value, the total oh, tickets against those resources of that type, 
the total number of unique resources of that type, and then the average condition grade. Scroll over to see all of my inventory. Now you can see some have a null value. The data that I'm pulling with resource inventory, the data is only as good as the data you put into the app, into web checkout. So if you're spending a lot of time, you know, performing inventory, creating tickets, um, grading your inventory, this is a great way to get that information in real time and put it in a nice summary view so you can make decisions based on your inventory data. And then I've also included a upcoming replacements report, right? Since I am using replacement date as a field to indicate when items need to be replaced, right? And I've, since I have my condition grade, I can see here my RA is coming up for replacement in, on September 14th, and the condition grade is for poor. So this one probably needs to be replaced. But if I look at here at my number one and number two, the condition grade is good. So these two, I won't need to budget to replace. Right. So this information you can get out of web checkout as a simple import, but it's so nice to have my inventory as well as usage information in one report. And again, it's gonna update in real time. So if I made changes to my RE plus the replacement date, let's say it, uh, I wanna replace this sooner, once I make the change in web checkout, this report will change you know, within 15 minutes. And then similarly with these two that are in still in good condition, I can move the replacement date farther into the future. We'll revisit this maybe next year. And one of the advantages of having multiple data sources with Google Data Studio, there's this concept of blending reports. It's basically merging or joining two reports into one. Um, so I have usage data here on the left here. It's by resource type. And this was on my, I think this was the second or third report that I highlighted here. This is the total count of checked out resources, the unique count of checked out resources and total usage hours. And then my inventory data here shows me the total number of uh, resources of within that type. Now I wanna join these two together to see one nice chart. And I simply just did a right click on both of those charts when I was editing this report and you click blend. And since the key is the resource type, they're the same in both reports, I was able to join that information in one report. Here's my inventory count. I have 50 internal powers, um, four, only four of the 50, the unique were checked out. So 8% of my internal power resources were actually circulated, um, but I had 11 total checkouts with 365 hours. So again, this would have taken me some V lookups, two reports to join and creating a chart. It'd take me some time, but with Google Data Studio, it took me mere minutes, okay? So in conclusion with data feeds and using a data visualization tool, you no longer have to spend time recreating or even updating re these reports. These reports will update uh, automatically as you use web checkout and now you can spend your time making decisions. Okay. So this concludes my session on data feeds in Google Data Studios. Uh, again, we will send out a link to this report. You can interact with it. And if you do decide to use data feeds and you're interested in this report that we put together, uh, you can connect your data source into this report, assuming we're using the same fields, and it will populate an automat, uh, it will update the results with your data. All right. Okay, great. I will open it up to questions. Uh, okay, so our team here did a great job actually addressing these, or excuse me, um, writing out these questions here. So give me one moment here and let me get situated. Um, okay. 
So Alex from UWW asks, are the feed URLs secure? That's a great question. Um, so the feed, you do, again, you don't need a login for the, to get this data. The URL is the secret, is the secret. So while we can create, so anyone who has the URL can access the data. So it, it will be important for you, for all of us to create a, um, to create a secure a URL that is uh, the URL is a secret so anyone can access it so we can work with you to create a very I can't think of the word right now but to create a uh, a URL that's you know not easily available or easily accessible by you know, the key terms or words that we use to put the URL together. Alex did that Aaron did that answer your question so if you have the URL you can access the data. Yes, an obfuscated URL. Yes, thank you. All right, so Ablay from BronxNet says, how can we generate the data URLs? Are, and are these URLs specific to each checkout center? And are these URLs secure? So we address the, UR, the security of the URL and the generating the URL is done by our team. This is a custom development work. Um, so we would you would provide us what custom reports you would like in a data feed and then we would we you can also provide us the url that you would want it to be um, or part of the url and we can add that to the url and they are specific to each report so you can include multiple checkout centers um, or based on your search term. So if you want a unique report for each checkout center, it, then it would be specific to each, each center. Did I address your question? Okay, great. Any other questions about data feeds or uh, anything you wanna discuss? You can open it up for discussion. This definitely doesn't have to be questions. This was brought up in our user in our users list. If anyone was using Power BI to generate reports, we didn't have much chatter. But I know with large institutions, Power BI is an awesome tool. It's pretty costly, um, but large institutions get a great deal on that. So if you are using Power BI, you can definitely use data feeds to pull the data and have this dashboard automatically update with reports that you're using. And Aaron asks, is there a way to set up data feeds without engaging professional services? You know, this does require our team to provide the feed. And there is an additional charge for the setting up a data feed. It is a one-time fee for the professional service hours, but it is supported. So that means after each upgrade, we'll make sure that your data feeds are working, pulling the data properly. And there's no maintenance fee. It's just a one-time service uh, fee for the time it takes our team to generate the reports. It's very, it's custom to each in each instance. Um, fortunately, there's no out of the box template it, since everyone has different set of data they're looking to to, to provide. Um, and Annie asks, if you change the search details after you submit the info for the feed, will it change the feed results? Uh, no, it will not change the feed results. We'll take the report that you created and we'll use that as our guide to create the feed, but it will not automatically change. So if you are changing it, then you would need to contact us and then we'd have to make changes to that feed. That's a good question. These are all good questions. Any other questions about the data feed or anything about the report? I'd like to see. I am no Google Data Studio expert. I've watched a few tutorials. And again, it's pretty intuitive to use. If you've used Excel and pivot tables, this is far easier. Um, 
you do have the option to create pivot tables in Google Data Studio as well. Is anyone using Google Data Studio? I've said that times. Anyone using that now? I think it's relatively, it came out of beta in 2018, I believe. So it's fairly, it's been around for a little bit. Okay, if no further questions, I'm happy to turn this over and open it up to just discussions. If you all want to have any questions for web checkout, for our team or for one another, you want to pose to the group? Um, sorry, yeah, I have one more question. Um, sure. My name is Abloy from Bronxnet. Uh, would it be possible to have this as a built-in feature in the future versions of the system so a uh, operator can have a flexibility of auto-generating the URLs? I don't believe so. I, be I believe there's multiple things. This is, is, is pretty technical, more technical than I can explain, but I, my understanding, it's taking like three different um computer languages to create this feed so i don't believe it's something that will be mainlined for operators to generate the, the feed in the near future i won't say never but it, will, it won't not it, not in the near future okay i see thank you mm -hmm. um katie the calendar feed urls are still very much there those are those are in the application um, and those will not go anywhere, but the data feed URLs require our team, our development team to provide that. Um, one more question, following up on uh, Katie's question. Um, the information that the um, data calendar URLs provide, are, are they the same type of data that the data feeds provide on the uh, web checkout generated URLs? Uh, the calendar URLs, they provide like checkout and reservation activity. So you could see all of your upcoming reservations or current checkouts in a calendar view. So it would not, it would not be uh, like information that you would find for reporting purposes, but it's only just to see in a calendar like iCal or Google Calendar or Outlook. I see, okay. And no problem. Um, Katie, I can follow up with you. Uh, there, we have several customers who use SSO or single sign-on and we can work with you to adjust the configuration. So you should, you could use calendar feeds with single sign-on. So that'll be a, my takeaway for you. And if anyone's having that issue where you, you're having issues viewing the calendar feeds due to single sign-on, let us know, let our support team know. We can always help with that. Great, no further questions or discussions. I'm happy to wrap this up, but I'm also happy to stay on and anyone has, Anyone to discuss or questions? All right, well, you're, well, we'll save some time this morning. So come back this afternoon, same Zoom link. Um, we will be highlighting uh, the new facilities app. AJ Uman will be showing us around how we can, you can now manage and distribute keys uh, in web checkout and the facilities application. And then followed by John Solorzano, you all may know him as our, one of our head uh, support team members, but he is also our information security analyst and he will be uh, reviewing how, what we do behind the scenes to ensure that your web checkout data is safe, both on the application side and then also for on the server side for those who are hosted with us. 
And so if no further questions, I'll give the time back of your morning or your afternoon. Enjoy your break and we'll be back. We'll meet back here at 2 p.m. Central Time today. Thank you everyone for your time. We'll see you all soon.